Hello, hello everybody. Wow, what a large crowd. Uh, that was a great introduction. Never seen that before, Noam. That is the first time that a speaker has been clapped to, honestly, when he walks in the room. Um, I'm amazed. Uh, my name is John Tillo, and I'd like uh, first off to say thanks, thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, on behalf of uh, World Affairs Program, funded by GSB, who are sponsoring this event. Um, let's see, uh, before we welcome Noam, um, I'd like to explain the format we're going to use for asking questions. First, if you have a question, please ask it during the designated question and answer uh, session after Noam's speech, and use this main microphone right here, and please form a line, because um, we have so many people in here tonight. Uh, then after the question and answer session, Noam will have a brief book signing uh, back in the Great Hall, which is all the way back there. Um, so uh, be, be prepared for that, but be very brief as there are so many people who have so many things to tell Noam, undoubtedly. Uh, so take, so take, a, take a brief second, please. And i also like to let you know that there's um, schedules of additional Committee on Lectures events we have coming up. Um, they're right over here to my left. Um, in the back corner. Uh, so please um, go over there and uh, pick one up to see if there's any upcoming lectures that interest you before the semester ends. Um, with that, Ramsey, Ramsey Tezdal is going to do the introduction for Noam. So Ramsey, go ahead. Okay. Good evening and thank you very, very much uh, for coming tonight. Um, but before we begin and introduce Dr. Chomsky, I'd like to um, have uh, Gary Tartikoff please stand up. Gary is retiring uh, this summer um, after 22 years chairing the committee, the World Affairs uh, with the Committee on Lectures. Um, Dr. Noam Chomsky first spoke at Mr. Tartikoff's first year and is now speaking again um, at his last year. So. <laughs> Please help me in thanking Gary. Um, in August 2003, um, I emailed Dr. Chomsky, inviting him to speak at Iowa State. To my, to my surprise, he responded. <laughs> Although he declined my offer, he encouraged me to keep working. Well, Dr. Chomsky, it took me three years, but three years later, here you are at Iowa State again. So thank you for coming. <laughs> Do Dr. Chomsky has written and lectured widely um, on linguistics, philosophy, intellectual history, contemporary issues, and international affairs and U.S. foreign policy. He is on faculty in the Department of Linguistics and Philosophy at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Tonight he will be speaking on g global justice and human rights. It is with my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Noam Chomsky to Iowa State. first question is whether you can hear me. So yes? No. That's, how about that? Is that any better? No. How about that? Still no good. Okay. Any uh, techies around who know how to fix this? Uh, could you hear him? You could. So there's something about my voice. Uh, see, anything got to be pushed here? Hello? Can we get the mic turned up, please? That one's working? Well, I'll use that. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, here, I'll... Do you want to hold uh, how's that? I put it in there? Okay, yeah. If it drifts, just start uh, letting me know. Hold it close. Okay, can you hear me in the back? Yeah, okay. Uh, Gary, I hope I'm not responsible for your forced retirement. <laughs> Just one comment on the book signing later. I've signed books all over the world, and the worst experience I ever had uh, was in Brazil. And the reason is everybody in Brazil has about four names. 
none of which I can understand. So if there are any Brazilians who want book sign, please write your name out. <laughs> Every other country is okay. Uh, 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 what I'd like to do actually is just make a couple of remarks on, uh, is on the issues that are of the greatest concern uh, to Americans now and for some time, in fact. Uh, uh, judging by polls, uh, actually for some time, the greatest area of concern for Americans is the Middle East. The most serious problem, uh, according to Gallup polls, uh, is, uh, and in fact the, the highest uh, throughout 2000 for a long time before, uh, twice as high as the next, uh, more than twice as high as the next uh, problem is Iraq. The second greatest problem, less than half that ranking, is the economy. Uh, the most feared country is Iran. Uh, we could ask whether that's because Iran is really feared or because uh, uh, it's been the subject of an unremitting barrage of uh, government media propaganda uh, designed to make people terrified of Iran. It'd be an interesting research project. Uh, you recall, I'm sure, that uh, we've, we, we repeatedly go through this experience, most recently in the fall of 2002, when there was a huge government media barrage uh, uh, warning everybody that you have to be afraid of Saddam Hussein quickly drove the United States off the international spectrum. Uh, everybody hated Saddam, in particular the countries he'd invaded, Kuwait and Iraq, but only Americans were afraid of him, terrified of him. And it's happened repeatedly before, something that ought to concern us. Uh, the only other area of the Middle East that receives uh, enormous coverage, uh, usually more than any other country, often more than all other foreign countries combined, is Israel. Uh, and that provides a telling example of the topic of uh, least concern to Americans, at least judging by the written word, and that's the fate of Palestinians. I'll come back to that. Uh, the second topic I want to discuss is we'll keep just to domestic concerns. Uh, so what is what are the major domestic concerns of Americans? Well, there's an easy winner on that. Uh, Ella polls again. It's health care. So I'll say something about that. And thirdly, if there's enough time, uh, I'll say a couple of words about what my personal view is about what ought to be the major concerns. So let's begin with what is the major concern of the Middle East. Major problem or serious problem is Iraq. Uh, there's plenty of commentary on Iraq. Uh, on the other hand, there's very little reporting on Iraq, and there's a reason for that. It's not that reporters are cowards or that they're not there. It's that the military catastrophe that the U.S. has created in Iraq ha has absolutely no precedent that I can think of. You can't, first time there's been a war where you can't report from it. Uh, reporters are mostly stuck in the green zone, the heavily fortified zone in uh, downtown Baghdad, or else they're embedded, you know, surrounded by Abrams tanks and troops and so on. And there's very limited reporting that you can do uh, in, that, uh, in that manner, so we're really not getting reporting. The reporting you're getting is mostly from Iraqi strangers who then give information or whatever they give to reporters in the green zone who sign their reports and dateline Baghdad, but you know, could just as easily be dateline Washington. Uh, on the other hand, there is a great deal of discussion, and it's uh, uh, obviously an important topic, uh, and it is the problem that Americans feel is the greatest problem that they face. Uh, of particular importance is the framework of the discussion. Uh, it's uh, narrow, but familiar. Actually, a couple of weeks ago, I had an interview with uh, a Polish reporter, a reporter for the leading Polish newspaper, and we were talking about this, and I asked him if uh, he uh, had been reading uh, Pravda during the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. 
I didn't have to say anything else. He just laughed. Uh, the reason is the reporting was the framework was about the same. Uh, noble cause, uh, too many casualties. Uh, can't give the freedom and uh, benefits to the poor people of Afghanistan that we're trying to because of the terrorists and the bandits and so on and so forth. Uh, that's all you could talk about. And in fact, that's true here. The framework of discussion here about uh, 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 Iraq is approximately at the level of a high school newspaper reporting on the local football team. I mean, you can ask, how are they doing? You know, can we do better? Should we get a different coach? Like uh, the, general, the general, generals are now saying about our coach. Uh, uh, this, you know, why are these terrorists preventing us from doing all the wonderful things we want to do, and so on? You know, that's the framework of discussion. Uh, uh, it's a noble cause. The question is, could, could we win somehow? Uh, that's familiar to uh, those of you who are uh, uh, interested in uh, things a few years ago. Uh, and scholarship might take a look at the leading journal of the. Uh, Society of the Historians of uh, American Foreign Relations. It's called Diplomatic History. The current issue and their current professional journal, the last issue of it, happened to be devoted to Vietnam. And uh, 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 there's a debate. The, the debate has a range of opinions discussed scholarship, in scholarship. Uh, there's the dovish extreme, which says it was a mistake, you know, tried to do the right thing, we misunderstood, uh, I didn't know enough about Vietnamese history, uh, we misunderstood the doctrine of containment and so on. It was too costly, it was a bad mistake. And then there's the, what's called the hawks, noble cause, agree with the doves, but we could have won uh, if we hadn't been stabbed in the back. We have to learn how to win next time. Uh, and what about the population of the United States? Well, we happen to know a lot about the popular opinion. That's interesting. Uh, by 1969, about 70% of the population uh, thought, said, that the war was not a mistake. It was fundamentally wrong and immoral. But that's not an option in scholarship, and it was not an option in journalism. And so those numbers remain pretty stable until the most recent studies, which is pretty astonishing, because people are saying that on their own. They haven't read it. They haven't heard it. Uh, but somehow they still think it. If it was a topic of discussion, the numbers would be undoubtedly far higher. But anyhow, the population is just kind of off the spectrum. Uh, that's, uh, it's worth noticing that that brings up a pretty serious uh, domestic problem about the dominant uh, intellectual and moral culture in the United States. That's a problem that has enormous implications for us and uh, by virtue of U.S. power for the entire world. Uh, well, there are, there's something missing from the discussion of Iraq, totally missing. That's the question of aggression. So you might do a search and see if you've ever seen that word mentioned in connection with the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Anybody ever call it aggression? Uh, well, uh, and so that was never any problem when we were discussing the Russians in Afghanistan. When the Russians invaded Afghanistan, everyone called it aggression. Uh, and uh, uh, rightly, that's what it was. Also, there was no problem giving the reasons, uh, even reasons that went beyond the actual one. So they were invading Afghanistan, it was alleged, because they wanted to gain access to the oil of the Middle East. Dubious, but at least that was the charge. Uh, they wanted to extend their power something like that. Those are standard reasons that we give when somebody else does something. But for ourself, that's off the agenda. That's taboo. Strict taboo. Cannot be. Uh, our leaders only act from noble intentions. They make mistakes. Uh, they don't understand. They don't know enough about foreign cultures. So, you know, they didn't study Vietnamese at Yale or whatever it was. Uh, but they can't be doing anything wrong. Only other, every other country does something wrong all the time. I mean, we discuss them with no problems, allies, enemies, and so on, uh, but not us. Uh, there's a name for that in uh, American intellectual history. It's called American exceptionalism. 
It's traced back to what's called Wilsonian idealism you know, up to the present. This, the United States is a city on the hill. It's exceptional, different from everyone else. There's a lot of things wrong with that phrase. But the most obvious thing that's wrong with it, which is rarely discussed, is that it seems to be a historical universal. I've yet to find a single great power that didn't have the same exceptionalism, including the worst monsters. So I hate to mention the precedents because we don't want to think about them. But another research project you might look at is to see if you can find any violent, aggressive power, any imperial power, that did not present itself in exactly the same fashion. A uniquely noble, uh, totally benevolent, uh, giving everything to the benefit of others, uh, badly understood, you know, hated by the people we're trying to help because they don't understand us and so on. And try to find an exception. Which have looked pretty hard uh, in countries that have records. My suspicion is that if we had records from Genghis Khan, we'd probably find the same thing. So American exceptionalism appears to be universal. That doesn't mean we should be willing to tolerate it, but we should recognize where we are and what we stand. Well, what about the concept of aggression? It's a well-defined concept. You know, it's not obscure. It was defined uh, at the Nuremberg Tribunals. Uh, that's, in fact, what laid down the standard for contemporary international law on these issues. It was defined by the uh, chief of counsel for the prosecution, U.S. Justice uh, Robert Jackson. Uh, we really ought to study. Uh, he defined, uh, to the tribunal, he said, an aggressor is a state that carries out invasion of its armed forces with or without a declaration of war of the territory of another state. Well, that's clear, unambiguous, you know, I'll explain it to my grandchildren with no problem. Uh, that was backed up by an authoritative General Assembly resolution accepted without objection. Uh, the Nuremberg Tribunal went on to define aggression as the supreme international crime which encompasses, which differs from other crimes in that it encompasses within it all the evil that follows. Okay, so every horrible thing that happens after the aggression, that's part of the supreme international crime. In the case of Iraq, it means uh, of grave, uh, the much worse war crimes in Fallujah, comparably worse than of grave. Uh, it uh, includes the toll on the population, about which we can find out a lot if we choose. So by October 2004, that's after 16 months, the most careful, best analysis of the number of dead uh, as a result of the invasion was about 100,000. And that was on pretty conservative assumptions, if you look at the way it was carried out. Uh, by now it's, who knows, maybe double that. Uh, but by October 1964, uh, acute malnutrition had doubled uh, to the level since the invasion, had doubled, it was then at the level of Burundi, uh, that's below Haiti and Uganda. Uh, UNICEF added that that translates to roughly 400,000 Iraqi children suffering from wasting a condition characterized by chronic diarrhea and dangerous deficiencies of protein. This incidentally is in a country where uh, hundreds of thousands of children had been killed by the US-UK sanctions, the called UN sanctions, but they were in fact US-British sanctions. Uh, it's become much worse since that was October 64 and there's plenty more. So let me just mention one example that's very rarely discussed uh, the educational system. It was devastated under the sanctions, and it's been dealt a terrible blow uh, under the occupation. Uh, here's some quotes from a Western-trained, U.S.-trained uh, Iraqi scientist, uh, Imad Kaduri, a recent article which appeared in the Egyptian press, unfortunately not here. Uh, he uh, says that the invasion led to looting and destruction of 84% of Iraqi universities, the liquidation of university professors, and the implementation of sectarian attitudes and practices among students. And that's in a country which boasted probably the first university in the world, established in 1227. It was a center of learning uh, that was 
destroyed by the Mongol invasion of 1258, then reestablished, and it remained intact and well preserved until the US led invasion, when along with the rest of Iraq's historical and cultural sites, it suffered destruction and negligence and may not survive. Uh, hundreds of scientists and other educators have been assassinated, many are fleeing. Uh, there's speculation in Iraq that some of this is uh, Israeli Mossad death squads. Doesn't matter whether that's true or false, it tells you something about the prevailing uh, mood. And we can go on. Well, there are accepted consequences of uh, aggression. Uh, again, we can go back to Nuremberg. The consequences of aggression were hanging, uh, not for people who pushed Jews into crematoria, but for the leadership, not for the soldiers, for the leaders. Now, that's who was tried at Nuremberg. Uh, for example, the German foreign minister, von Ribbentrop, was hanged. One of the main charges against him was that uh, he was involved in a preemptive war against Norway. Uh, Germany invaded Norway to deter the very real threat of a British attack from Norway. Uh, sentence, hanging. Uh, there are, uh, at the trial, uh, Justice Jackson uh, pronounced some eloquent words which are worth thinking about. Uh, he said at the final judgment, if certain acts of violation of treaties are crimes, they are crimes whether the United States does them or whether Germany does them. And we are not prepared to lay down a rule of criminal conduct against others, which we would not be willing to have invoked against us. We must never forget that the record on which we judge these defendants is the record on which history will judge us tomorrow. To pass these defendants a poisoned chalice is to put it to our own lips as well. Actually, that's also in US law. There's a War Crimes Act of 1996 passed by a Republican Congress, uh, which uh, 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 includes uh, uh, severe punishment for grave breaches of the Geneva Convention. Uh, death sentence if the breaches uh, lead to killings. Uh, violations of the Geneva Conventions aren't even concealed. In fact, they're reported with pride, which is kind of interesting and remarkable. So take, say, the invasion of Fallujah in November 2004. The first act of the invaders was to take over the General Hospital. And on the front page of the newspaper, take a look at the front page of the New York Times that day, uh, it's not hidden big picture of uh, patients lying on the floor, uh, hands tied behind their backs, uh, doctors lying on the floor, all under guard in the Fallujah General Hospital. Uh, the uh, reporter says that the General Hospital was a legitimate target uh, because it was producing uh, propaganda. Uh, the propaganda was casualty figures. Uh, which, according to the reporter, are inflated casualty figures, inflated because our dear leader said so. But as far as it were, uh, the Geneva Conventions are very explicit about this. You know, read them. They say, in any conflict, all combatants must com protect completely any health system. Medical, uh, doctors, nurses, hospitals must be protected by all combatants. Anything else is a grave breach of the conventions. Uh, if anyone died as a result of that treatment, patients being thrown on the floor with hands tied behind their backs and so on, uh, if anyone died, then George Bush uh, should get the death sentence under U.S. law. US law. Uh, that's the part of the uh, however, that's probably not a problem. Because as you may remember, his legal counsel, Alberto Gonzalez, had foreseen this. Now, there's a memo which ought to be famous, in which uh, Gonzalez advised President Bush before this that he ought to effectively rescind the Geneva Conventions to reduce the threat of prosecution. A very interesting memorandum. Uh, the, uh, uh, some of them didn't have to be rescinded. The U.S. did sign the 1949 Geneva Conventions, but there are additional protocols. Well, there's a protocol of 1977 uh, that introduces what's called the, technically, the doctrine of distinction. It says armed forces must distinguish civilians from combatants. Okay. 
civilians are have to be protected. Uh, combatants you can attack. Uh, well, there's no problem with that one because the U.S. didn't sign it. There are a few others who didn't sign it. Uh, three countries, uh, which at that point uh, had military occupations going on, didn't sign it because a military occupation almost inevitably means you're killing civilians. It's Israel, India, and Indonesia. Uh, so therefore attacks against civilians are standard. A couple of other countries didn't sign. Uh, Iraq, Iran, Sudan, Burma, Andorra, uh, and a couple of others, uh, including us. Uh, right now, as you know, there's a trial going on of Saddam Hussein. Uh, the trial is for crimes that he committed in 1982. Well, there's an interesting year. Uh, 1982 is a very important year in U.S.-Iraqi relations. So, Free Press ought to have some headlines uh, explaining that 1982 is the year when Ronald Reagan uh, removed Iraq from the lists of states supporting terrorism so that the United States would be able to provide him with aid, including means to develop weapons of mass destruction. Uh, nuclear weapons, missiles, uh, biological weapons, chemical weapons, and so on. And then a certain gentleman named Donald Rumsfeld uh, flew over to Iraq to firm up the, uh, uh, the arrangement. That's 1982, uh, the year in which, for crimes, in which, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, Saddam is now being tried for. And a second charge was just added correctly. It's the uh, much worse crimes that he committed uh, in the massacres of the Kurds in uh, 1987. Well, uh, what, what, how did the U.S. react to that? Blamed Iran you know, uh, for the gas attacks against the Kurds and the massacres. No, no further reaction. Military aid, other aid continued. Uh, the, uh, the U.S. did the same, uh, at the same time, May 1987, uh, even after Saddam did something that no country can get away with, with one exception. Uh, in May 1987, uh, the Iraqi Air Force attacked a U.S. A ship, USS Stark, uh, in patrolling the Gulf and killed 37 uh, seamen. Well, almost nobody gets away with that. Now, the only other country that's gotten away with that is Israel in 1967 when it attacked the USS Liberty, also killing several dozen seamen. But uh, that, there, the circumstances were more ambiguous, or not very, and there was a lot of protest from the, up to the highest level of the military and the government and the Liberty crewmen, who in fact are still uh, publishing their newspaper and seeking some kind of recognition and restitution about this, to no effect, of course. Uh, but in the case of the Stark, there was nothing. It was a demonstration of uh, the passion of the love affair of the Reagan administration with Saddam. It's unique. Just try to imagine if any other country did this, other than one that you really uh, are deeply involved with. Uh, that's uh, the year of the massive crimes for which uh, Saddam's being charged. Uh, it, it continues. Uh, a year after that, uh, a U.S. Uh, uh, cruiser, the USS Vincennes, uh, shot down an Iranian commercial airliner uh, in the Gulf in, in Iranian territorial waters and in commercial uh, airspace. Uh, it uh, killed 290 people. Uh, that convinced Iran that they'd better capitulate to Saddam Hussein's aggression. I mean, Saddam had invaded Iraq. Uh, Iran with U.S. support killed hundreds of thousands of people, chemical weapons, huge massacre. But this finally convinced the Iranians they better capitulate. They're not going to be able to fight the United States. Uh, the uh, captain of the nearby vessel, nearby the Vincent, was so horrified by what happened, he was watching it all, that he denounced it in the uh, Navy's official journal, the Journal of the Naval Institute. He wrote there that he wondered aloud in disbelief as he observed the downing of what was obviously a civilian airliner in a commercial corridor. Perhaps, he said, out of a need to prove the viability of the high-tech missile system of the Vincent, which they were calling Robo Cruiser at the time because of the way it was behaving. 
of the same journal, the Naval Institute Journal, published an acid review of the Navy Department cover-up uh, written by a Marine, uh, Marine Corps colonel, retired Marine Corps colonel, military historian David Evans. Uh, he quotes one high military officer attending the official hearings who concluded that our Navy is too dangerous to deploy. Well, that was taken care of by Bush number one. Remember, that's the liberal Bush. He said, I will never apologize for the United States of America. I don't care what the facts are. Well, you know, the Iranians do care what the facts are, and they've surely not forgotten, plus a lot more, back to 1953 when the U.S. and Britain overthrew the parliamentary government and installed a brutal tyrant. Uh, forgetting is a luxury but only for those who hold the clubs, like us. We can forget. The victims can't forget. Well, support for Saddam Hussein continued. It went on after the end of the Iraq War, with no change. Uh, after Saddam Hussein's worst crimes, the atrocities against the Kurds, uh, it, uh, uh, after the chemical warfare against Iran, still went on. And the way it went on is kind of remarkable. Here's some testimony before the Senate uh, in, uh, by Gary Milholland. He's one of the major nuclear experts in the United States. Uh, he points out that in 1989, remember, 1989, just remember what was going on then, the Pentagon and the Department of Energy invited three Iraqi scientists with the blessing of the Department of State to attend a a detonation conference in Portland, Oregon. There they learned from experts all over the world how shockwaves detonate nuclear weapons. Now, these three Iraqis came from the site that produced the first components for Iraq's high explosive portion of its first nuclear weapon. Uh, that's 1989, long after the end of the war with Iran after the worst massacres and crimes for which we now claim we have to punish Saddam Hussein. Uh, also continuing at that time was same aid, biotoxins, means to develop nuclear weapons and missiles, uh, 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 chemical warfare, and so on. Uh, and George Bush, number one, gave the reasons, not a secret. Uh, it was challenged on that. He said, well, we have a responsibility to hate aid U.S. exporters. Besides, support for Saddam Hussein improves uh, stability in the region. Okay, that went on up till the probably the day of the invasion of Kuwait, same with the British, uh, and it went on after the, the first war against Iraq. After, uh, at the end of the war, February 1991, the U.S. had total control of the region, just absolute Iraqi army totally smashed. Uh, you may recall then that there was an uprising, a Shiite uprising in the South, uh, which the U.S. actually called for. And yes, there was a rebellion. And actually, it was assisted by rebelling Iraqi generals. Uh, they didn't ask the U.S. for any help, uh, but they didn't expect what happened. What happened is that the Bush administration authorized Saddam Hussein to, this, to, to massacre them. They didn't say do it, they just authorized them to use military aircraft, heavy equipment, uh, to slaughter the Shiite rebels, probably tens of thousands of them. That's 1991. You know. Well, again, the victims don't forget. And that was explained, too. Uh, we prefer to forget, but it was explained. Actually, it was explained in the New York Times. Uh, the uh, Middle East correspondent of the New York Times, Alan Cowell, is still there. Uh, he wrote, he said, well, you know, we're kind of upset about these massacres, which of the Shiites probably would have overthrown Saddam Hussein, uh, but he said there was a consensus among the U.S. and its allies, that means Britain and Saudi Arabia, there was a consensus that Saddam Hussein offered more hope for the stability of the region than those who were trying to overthrow him. In other words, Iraqis do not have the right to overthrow Saddam Hussein. That's not going to be allowed, because then they'll be running their own country. So therefore, we'll support Saddam Hussein. Uh, the chief diplomatic correspondent of the New York Times, it's a technical name that means pretty much a State Department representative in the New York Times, uh, that was Thomas Friedman at the time, he explained it. He said, uh, from the U.S. government point of view, he said, the best of all worlds 
for Iraq. It would be an iron-fisted military junta uh, ruling Iraq the same way Saddam did. He's kind of an embarrassment, but uh, we've got to get somebody, somebody just like him. If we can't get him, we'll have to be satisfied. Uh, if there isn't anyone else, it'll have to be him. Uh, that's at the, after the slaughter of the Shiites. You know? Uh, anybody remembering any of that? Like it's not a deep seat secret. You don't have to look at classified information. Just at the, you know, the main newspaper in the world. You know? Well, that's uh, again for those who uh, have the luxury of forgetting. It's easy to forget. But it almost don't. Uh, this and a lot more uh, raises a number of questions. Namely, who should be in the dock alongside of Saddam Hussein for these crimes alone? Well, that's another question that can't be asked, can't be considered. Uh, uh, what uh, should be done about Iraq? It is a real problem. Americans are right to regard it as a serious problem. Well, before trying to answer that question, you have to uh, be clear about some basic principles. And there's one fundamental principle. Uh, that principle is that invading armies have no rights whatsoever. They have responsibilities, but no rights. Uh, their responsibilities are, first of all, doesn't matter whether it's the Russians in Afghanistan, the US in Iraq, or anybody else, you know, the Japanese in North China, pick your example. Uh, they have uh, the responsibility, first of all, to uh, pay reparations, in fact, enormous reparations uh, to the victims. Uh, in this case, it's reparations not only for the invasion and the atrocities and so on and everything that followed uh, the supreme international crime, but also for the sanctions which killed hundreds of thousands of people, devastated the civilian society, strengthened the tyrant, probably preserved them, kept them from being overthrown the way other tyrants that the U.S. and Britain backed were overthrown, many of them similar, quite similar to him. So uh, uh, reparations for that, and in fact a lot more. Uh, reparations for the support for Saddam Hussein during the, uh, the 1980s, during the period of his worst crimes. That's not just the U.S. and Britain, it's also others, like Germany and Russia and France and others. Yeah, they all owe massive reparations. These are points that generalize uh, well beyond. Uh, the second responsibility of invaders uh, is to follow the will of the victims. Well, we have a pretty good sense of what that is. There are regular U.S., British run studies of popular opinion. The most recent one, a couple of weeks ago, was was reported. Brookings Institution does a regular analysis of what they call the State of Iraq. It was published and found it in the New York Times. According to them, 87% uh, of Iraqis uh, want a concrete timeline for U.S. withdrawal. Uh, well, that's up from 76% uh, a year earlier. Well, if those figures are accurate, they're astonishing. Uh, what that means is approximately 100% of Iraqis in Arab Iraq. The Kurds don't care. There's no troops up there. Uh, but it means, if the figures are right, about 100% of Iraqis in Arab Iraq, where there actually are occupying forces, want a concrete timeline for withdrawal. Uh, I think if you had done a poll in Vichy, France, or say in Poland under uh, Russian occupation, you would not have found figures like that. It's almost certain. Uh, well, uh, another, another thing to think about. Uh, Bush, and, Bush and Blair have an answer to that. Simple answer, no. There cannot be a timeline for withdrawal. Well, in part, that just reflects the imperial mentality, you know, deeply rooted imperial mentality. Uh, the voice of the lower orders just doesn't matter, so forget it. Uh, it also reflects the very general disdain of the powerful for democracy. Uh, which probably correlates pretty well through history with pontification about love of democracy. There's another research project you might try. Uh, but it's much more than that. Uh, so uh, just to consider, for example, what the consequences of withdrawal would be. I mean, suppose that Iraq were actually granted some measure of sovereignty and a limited degree of democracy. That would be an absolute nightmare for Washington planners. So you can see why they're doing anything possible to prevent it. Well, just think what the foreign policy would be. They would have a Shiite majority. Uh, they would therefore have influence. 
Uh, they much prefer friendly relations with their powerful neighbor, Iran, Shiite, uh, than hostile relations. Uh, they already have close relations. A uh, majority of the, uh, the religious clerics in Shiite Iraq uh, come, either come from Iran, actually the Ayatollah Sistani comes from Iran, or have close connections with them. Uh, the main militia that's uh, running the south, the Badr Brigade, was actually trained in Iran and fought with Iran during the Iran-Iraq War. They have maintained connections. They've been strengthening them since the invasion. Uh, the, uh, and it goes beyond. Uh, the, right across the border in Saudi Arabia, uh, there's a, a Shiite majority, uh, bitterly oppressed by the U.S.-backed fundamentalist tyranny, continually trying to get some degree of rights and freedom. Uh, any move towards sovereignty across the border in Iraq is going to influence them. In fact, it already has uh, you know, movements, pressures, demonstrations for autonomy. And that happens to be where Saudi Arabian oil is. Uh, Iraqi oil is mostly in the Shiite area. And like a strange accident of history has placed most of the world's oil in Shiite areas, right around the Gulf. Uh, Iran, southern Iraq, Saudi Arabia. Just think what that means. Uh, that means possibly the development of an, of an alliance, maybe a loose alliance, uh, controlling most of the world's oil, independent of Washington. I mean, that's almost the worst nightmare that could be conjured up in Washington. Actually, it's a worse one. Uh, the U.S. is easily able to intimidate Europe. It doesn't take any trouble. If you want people to stop investing in Iran, uh, you shake your fist, uh, the Europeans pull out. But not everybody can be intimidated. There's one country that refuses to be intimidated. Uh, that's why it's considered a huge threat. It's China. Uh, they've been around for 4,000 years. Uh, they've been telling the barbarians to get lost and they don't get intimidated. Uh, so they continue to invest in Iran and in Saudi Arabia and to make military uh, relations with both of them, which again must be driving the civilians in Washington to berserk. Uh, well, uh, China happens to be at the core of an Asian energy security grid. The rising Asian economies want to get uh, uh, energy security. And they're developing. Actually, India even is overcome hostility with China to establish significant joint projects of energy cooperation. India hasn't yet decided whether to join the energy Asian group or to, you know, be like Britain, you know, sort of follow the orders of the master in Washington. That's what Bush's trip there was for a couple of weeks ago, uh, allowing him to have nuclear weapons if they do the right thing. But they're kind of on the board. They'll go, it could go either way. Well, and if India joins, which is likely, South Korea is already there, uh, Japan may or may not join, Russia's part of it. I mean, it's a huge system. If Iran joins, which they may, they may give up on Europe, uh, if uh, they're part of an alliance that controls Middle East oil, the huge prize, you know, the United States is a second-class power. I mean, it loses uh, uh, what was called uh, back in the 40s by the State Department, just talking about the Middle East, it loses the stupendous source of strategic power and the greatest material prize in world history, along with the critical leverage that it provides and the veto power, these are all quotes, against our industrial rivals. You have your hand on that spigot, you're in the world. That was understood by the British uh, 80 years ago. Well, you know, if you lose all of this, and what's worse, it jo joins up with a, a growing Asian independent uh, uh, system. It's the most dynamic uh, economic region of the world, you know, holds half of the world's foreign reserves and so on, uh, then you're really in trouble. And that's not the end of it. Uh, there's also a uh, Shanghai Cooperation Council, uh, which, again, based in China, but with Russia, and extending into the same mainly at Central Asia. The Central Asian countries are members of it, and they want independence from the United States. That's not a source of energy on the scale of the Middle East, but it's substantial and other resources. It's now regarded as kind of an alternative to NATO development. Well, I suppose the Middle East oil system joins up with that. Now, you can see what uh, 
uh, how frightening this is to uh, Washington planners. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, go on, but uh, just you can figure it out for yourself. Uh, any talk about exit strategies that does not consider these matters is just hot air. You know? I mean, easy to make up exit strategies, you know, but unless you consider what's involved, it's irrelevant. You have to at least consider what's involved. Well, we're not allowed to talk about any of this. Notice that it's all ignored. You know, take a look at the huge discussion about exit strategies. See how much attention has been given to the fundamental reasons why the U.S. cannot permit sovereignty and democracy in Iraq. Can't. You know, it would just be a terrible threat to the interest in dominating the world and controlling your industrial rivals. Uh, stupendous source of strategic power and the rest of it. It's not a small thing. So yeah, I'm going to fight to the nail to stop it. Doesn't mean that we should let them get away with it, but you might as well realize what's involved. You know, it's not a matter of trying to figure out um, how many ships to send to pull the troops out. Uh, that's irrelevant. You've got to talk about these things and think about them. But we're not allowed to do it, and we're not allowed to do it because of the famous uh, American exceptionalism. We have to be good North Koreans. Uh, we have to f follow the principle that says we must not attribute any objectives to our leaders. They only act out of noble impulses, unlike everyone else in the world. Uh, so therefore, we're not allowed to mention any of these things. In particular, there's a kind of an obscene word, which I won't say because it's too vulgar, so I'll spell it. It's spelled O-I-L. You're not supposed to talk about that. You can talk about it if the Russians are invading Afghanistan, but not if the U.S. invades the second major uh, resource of oil in the world, right in the center of the world's major energy resources. There, you can't mention it. It's called a conspiracy theory or something. Uh, we're supposed to believe that uh, the U.S. and Britain would have been delighted to liberate Iraq uh, if its chief export was, say, pickles and asparagus, uh, and if the major energy resource in the world were in the South Pacific. If you don't believe that, you're a conspiracy theorist or some other kind of lunatic. Uh, well, you know, as long as that kind of discipline reigns, uh, we're in real trouble, and the world is in real trouble. Uh, something that, those are, you know, shackles that have to be broken, and those are problems right here. Well, enough about Iraq. Let's turn to the biggest threat in the world, in the Iran. Uh, the threat is its uh, nuclear programs, okay? And no sane person wants Iran to have nuclear weapons, or for that matter, wants anyone to have nuclear weapons. Uh, it's too dangerous. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so far, but nevertheless, let's take a look at what's going on. I mean, so far, including, there was an announcement today that you might have seen that uh, Iran announced that it had reached the level of uranium enrichment. Let's say that's true. Uh, uh, everything that is known about, including that, happens to be within Iran's legal rights. As a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, yeah, that's exactly what it's allowed to do. Uh, Article 4 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the main treaty on nuclear weapons, says that signers of the treaty, which Iran is, uh, non-nuclear states, uh, have the right to uh, enrich uranium for uh, nuclear energy. Uh, furthermore, that's not uh, another little thing that isn't talked about, is that these Iranian programs that we are denouncing today are exactly the same programs that the U.S. was uh, uh, initiating and supporting in 1977, like my own university, MIT, back in 1977. Uh, under government initiative was planning, may have done it, it's all in secret, but was planning to uh, bring uh, nuclear engineers from Iran uh, to uh, learn how to carry out uranium enrichment. And the U.S. government, like Henry Kissinger, uh, Secretary of State at the time, explained that uh, Iran needs nuclear energy. Uh, it should, it should uh, preserve its uh, uh, hydrocarbon resources for other uses. Uh, and use nuclear energy for its energy resources. Well, now Henry Kissinger has a different line. He says Iran has so much oil, it can't possibly need nuclear energy, uh, so therefore it must be doing it to uh, 
uh, develop nuclear weapons. I think he was asked about that, you know, what, what's the difference in uh, position. He's pretty frank and honest. He said, well, then they were an ally. Uh, so then they needed <laughs> nuclear energy. And now they're an enemy. They're not following orders. So they don't need nuclear energy. Uh, but those are the same programs. You know, it's pretty hard to, like again, you're holding the club, and you're allowed to forget it, but Iranians don't forget it. Uh, well, uh, Article 4 which of the treaty, which does permit that, uh, the Bush administration wants to strengthen Article 4 so that it doesn't permit uranium enrichment for, by non-nuclear states. And actually they have a case. I mean, on that they have a strong case, I think. Uh, the reason is uh, technological development. Uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty was signed in 1970, and at that time there was a considerable gap between producing nuclear energy and producing nuclear weapons. Uh, since then, the gap has narrowed. So when you are capable of producing nuclear energy, you're a step away from nuclear weapons development. So it does make sense, as the Bush administration is calling for, for an international treaty to uh, strengthen Article 4. That's a good idea. Uh, but it must ensure, quoting, unimpeded access for non-military use in accord with the initial treaty bargain. Okay, and uh, there are ideas about how to do that. Uh, Mohammed al Baradei, who's the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, last year's Nobel Peace Prize laureate, uh, he proposed a couple of years ago that all production and processing of weapon usable material should be restricted exclusively to facilities under multinational control, accompanied above all, I'm quoting, by an assurance that legitimate would-be users would get their supplies. Uh, he suggested that that would be the first step towards fully implementing a 1993 UN resolution calling for a fissile material cutoff treaty, it's known as FISBAN in the trade, uh, which would cap and make public all inventories of fissile material still available. Uh, that would end the threat of nuclear weapons development and probable destruction of the species. Problem with all of this is it's dead in the water. Uh, the U.S. would never agree, certainly this administration, not probably not any. In fact, to my knowledge, there's only one country that has agreed to El Baradei's proposal. That's Iran. Uh, last February, it publicly agreed to this proposal. I want you to do an internet search and see, and see how much this was reported in the States. Uh, well, uh, that suggests one way to resolve the crisis, uh, except this proposal, join Iran and accept this proposal. Uh, but it would be a way to resolve the crisis if the United States were willing to abandon its unique status is what's called an outlaw state, which is uniquely exempt from international law and norms and treaty obligations. That's one step. Well, Article 4 of the NPT is paired with another article, Article 6. Uh, article 6 requires the nuclear states to carry out good faith efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons. Okay. Now, none of them have lived up to that obligation, which incidentally was reaffirmed by the World Court unanimously as a legal obligation. None of them have lived up to it, but the U.S. is by far the worst. The U.S. has last year officially rejected it, said it's not subject to Article 6, and it's developing new weapons, radical violation of it. In fact, it's even threatening use of nuclear weapons. You all know that. You're reading the newspapers. Uh, the Bush administration went on to rescind a collection of other treaties that were part of the initial bargain, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, the ABM Treaty, but most important of all, uh, FISBAN, Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty. That was in November 2004. Uh, the U.S. had said it wasn't going to allow it, uh, but nevertheless the U.N. voted on it. The vote was 174 to 1. There were two abstentions. Uh, one of them is Israel, which is reflexive has to vote with the U.S. Uh, the other was more interesting, it was Britain. And uh, the British ambassador explained his vote at the assembly meeting, said Britain supported the treaty. But this particular version, he said, divided the international community. It divided it 174 to 1. 
Uh, so therefore, Britain couldn't support it. Well, that tells you something about the priorities of new labor. Uh, compare survival of the species with shining the master's shoes. Okay, guess which one wins? Uh, and that's not an exaggeration. This is probably the most important vote in UN history. It was not reported. I couldn't find a word about it, except in the technical journals, you know, like the strategic analysis journals and the journals concerned with nuclear weapons and so on. Yeah, they reported it. And in fact, call it the most fundamental nuclear arms proposal. That's uh, Princeton physicist and arms control specialist Frank von Hippel, one of the leading figures in this field. Uh, this is the kind of thin thread on which survival uh, does hang and is further weakened but not worth reporting. Well, there was a, there is a, every five years there's a review conference on the non-proliferation treaty, the last one was last May. Uh, the, it was a total disaster, completely collapsed, there was a fair amount of coverage. Uh, the press blamed Iran, following the master's voice again. If you read the technical literature, you find it was shattered by the United States. Uh, the U.S. simply announced that it was not going to abide by any of the previous agreements uh, that it, the U.S. had made, that it was not subject to uh, the major restriction, and you know, just go jump in a lake, in other words. Uh, that was the end. Uh, it's uh, now common to read that if uh, Iran obtains nuclear weapons, then the NPT, Non-Proliferation Treaty, will be destroyed. Well, in reality, it's been shredded by Washington's abandonment of it, something else we ought to talk about. Well, let's go back to Iran. Uh, in the year 2004, the European Union and Iran uh, struck a bargain on how to deal with this situation. Iran agreed to temporarily suspend uranium enrichment, which it is legally allowed to do, but they said they would suspend it and in fact accept accelerated uh, extra inspection procedures, that's their side of the bargain. And on the other side of the bargain, the European Union promised, these are the words, to give Iran firm guarantees on security issues. Now, what are security issues? Security issues mean the very credible uh, U.S.-Israeli threats to bomb Iran. Those are the security issues. The U.S. is now willing to talk to Iran about security issues. Condoleezza Rice says, yeah, we'll talk to them about security issues. The security issues are their interference in Iraq. I mean, it, it's hard to read that without collapsing in ridicule. You know, suppose that Nazi Germany had offered it said they'd deal with Britain on security issues, namely British interference in occupied France. You know, uh, what could you say? Can you even make a comment about it? All right, that's what is meant here by security issues. But what the European Union and Iran meant are the real security issues, the very serious, very credible threats to bomb Iran. Well, uh, Iran uh, lived up to its side of the bargain. It did suspend the uranium enrichment. The European Union, under U.S. pressure, backed down from its side of the bargain. Europe is very easily intimidated, and so they backed down. Well, you know, after they backed down for a couple of years, Iran started uh, started up the programs of uranium enrichment. Uh, so makes another suggestion about how to deal with the crisis. And there's more. In May 2003, year before, Iran had offered to discuss security matters with the U.S. The U.S. refused same as North Korea. When the Bush administration came in, 2001, it abandoned uh, promises uh, which had led to North Korea's uh, uh, withdrawal from any development of nuclear weapons. Uh, the Bush administration abandoned uh, fuel supplies that had been promised, abandoned a nuclear reactor that had been promised, uh, started making very hostile threats. The reaction was predictable. Uh, North Korea, withdrew from the bargain. It withdrew from the NPT. It's now producing nuclear weapons. Now, these things are pretty predictable. You know, it's, uh, you can take a genius to figure them out. Well, all of this suggests ways to reduce what's the major threat in the world. Iran's perhaps uh, plans to develop nuclear weapons. But one is to call off the threats that are virtually urging Iran to develop nuclear weapons just as a deterrent 
Right? So the invasion of Iraq essentially sent the same instruction to the world. Instruction to the world. Instruction to the world. 